Well, here we are. I enjoyed what Alice had to say to me this morning. She came out and told me that she was reading through the book of James, and I'm glad she is. I'm glad we wish we all were. If you're not, I would encourage you to do so because we're going to be in James for quite a bit. But I have, I, I personally believe that all of the Bible is relevant to our particular needs today. But I really believe that the five chapters of the book of James are one of some of the most important in its relevancy. Well, that's a hard word for me to say. Uh, and uh, that there are many, many things in the book of James that we need to apply to our living today, especially making a special effort to do so. Many people do, however, feel that uh, question the authenticity of the book, uh, especially the faith only. James is one that says faith without works is dead. We ought to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And all through the book of James, it talks about what we ought to be doing as a result of our relationship to God and Jesus Christ. Uh, we have emphasized that we feel that James, the son of Elphis, uh, was the author. This is my, my own personal opinion. Uh, that it was written somewhere between 60, uh, 62, 60 AD and 62 AD. Uh, I also believe, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, that the dispersion as is mentioned, the first verse it happens to be the diversion, diversion, dispersion that was uh, uh, indicated in Acts, the first chapter, eighth chapter, and all this. And this uh, last week we talked about the first 17, 18 verses of the uh, 17 verses of the book of James, where we talked about the idea of. Uh, the uh, temptation, we talked about temptation, and we talked about God answering prayer and other needs. Now, we're going to begin with the 18th verse this morning, and there's uh, very short sections here that we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to hurry through it because I know that we're a little bit smaller number. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, and I'm going to say this last week, if you have any questions, all you have to do is raise your hand. And if I see you, I'll stop and recognize it. You can ask the question. But the 18th verse, in all reality, should have been put with the seven, uh, previous several verses and be a concluding verse of the 18th, uh, 17th chapter, Acts of James 1 17. I didn't do it that way. And the reason I did not do it is because I want to put a lot of emphasis on what that 18th verse says. And I want you to look at it, look at it very carefully. It says, of his own will beget he with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Now, I, I want to go back to the latter part of that first, where it says that we should be a part of the first fruits of his creation. The first fruits is when we become Christian. Jesus Christ is the first fruit. He's the first one to be risen from the dead. We have been risen from the dead when we were buried with Christ in Christian baptism. Then we will not realize the great fullness of that first fruits until after a time that we pass away and we are risen from the dead as the book of Jesus has promised that there will be a resurrection. And we need to realize that the first fruit, we are Christian. And that first fruit is something that we ought to be doing. But notice what it says at the very beginning. By his, speaking of God, through his son Jesus Christ, that we, uh, he begat us by his own will. Now, this is a verse, a verse portion of scripture that the premillennial, I'm not thinking, Predestinationist is very, very much involved. They said God chooses you, and He chooses you to be saved, but you're not, not going to be saved. We need to make a very strong difference, my brother. And I speak this in male and female as well. That there is a big difference between the foreknowledge of God and the predetermined will of God. There is a big difference. Now, I used to work 
in the Pritchard Building in Huntington. We were on the 13th floor. And one day I was had a problem with what I was doing, and I walked over to the window, I was looking out the window. Now, now I'm afraid of heights unless I'm in a building. And I was looking down and watching the traffic. <clears throat> and I saw one car coming down 6th Avenue that way, and one coming down 8th Avenue in that way. Neither one was paying attention to the light. And I thought to myself, there's going to be an accident. And sure enough, the one that was on the 6th Avenue ran the light, and the one that was coming down 8th Avenue, 8th Street, ran into it. Now, I did not predetermine that accident to happen. But I knew it was going to happen because of the circumstances that I saw. And there's a big difference in God predetermining what was going to happen in his prophecies and seeing what was going to happen through foreknowledge. Big difference. We need to make that difference. But notice how we are regarded through the word of truth, the Bible. Unless we follow what the Bible says, we are not begotten of God. And we need to remember that. And then it goes on and says in the verses 19 and 20, uh, through 21, Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I want to stop right there because I think it's very important that we notice this. What do we need in our world today, in our nation today? Our world. We need to be slow to speak. Oh, I wish there's many times that I could take words back, but you can't. Once a word is spoken, you can't do it. This is going to be discussed more fully in the third chapter of the book of James. I, I, we need to be slow to raft. We need to. Uh, be slow to speak, slow to raft. I wish there would be times I could take back the things I have said. Because uh, it, I was working for Rec TV and a man called in who was a foreigner. I could tell by the accent of his voice. Uh, and he was real upset. A multitude of things that he wanted me to discuss with him. And I, I wanted to put them in order that the easiest to answer to the hardest. So I said, first of all, and that set him off. He started to talk, talk in the Spanish language. I don't sure what, which one it was, Cuban, Mexican, or whatever. And he would not stop talking, and finally he hung up after five minutes and ran to the green. And he was angry. I think he would, if he would have listened to all his questions, would have been answered to his satisfaction. For the wrath of man, when we become angry, when we become angry, it is not according to the righteousness of God. Now, in uh, for the Ephesians in 4th chapter, the 26th verse, the Bible tells us to be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Uh, I think we need to realize that we can have anger in righteousing the nation without sinning. Sin not. How many times when we get angry, uh, we, we do what we are ashamed of afterwards? And we let in the next verse of Scripture says, let, Wherefore it be a, a lay apart all filthiness, all superiority of righteousness, of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which will be able to save your souls. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. Let us word meekness, humbleness. The engrafted word, I think the New International Version uses the word planted word. When I was preaching in Corbin, Kentucky, one of the members of the church there happened to like to fool around with plants. He was an older gentleman and he uh, liked to do things with uh, his plants. I, I stopped at his home when I, uh, very shortly after I started there. He had one tree in his backyard that he had grafted 
every fruit into it. He called it his fruit salad tree. It had peaches, it had apples, it had cherries, it had plums, all growing from one trunk of a tree. He was an expert when it comes to gratitude. Now think of that just for a moment. If we receive with meekness the engrafted word, the word is going to come into our heart. It is going to bear the fruit of that word and eventually it will take over our entire life that we will be doing the will of God as revealed by his word. And that is an important thing that we need to do. We need to realize that the engrafted word is a part of our accepting of Jesus Christ. We accept what Jesus said. We accept what God has told us. And that engrafted word will grow and become a part of our everyday existence. We move on. And I'm trying to hurry through this because this long-winded order of a person in charge this morning. We have a lot of time in his prayers and things like that. James goes on and tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doer of the word. That, that is hard. We ought to dedicate ourselves that when God speaks, we obey. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said that there are many people that, that are, they hear the word that they forget about it. Uh, in my first ministry, which was in Greenford, Ohio, I had a Sunday school teacher stand up in class one day and make a comment. I went to him in private and found out he believed this with all his heart. On Sunday morning, you put on the cloak of righteousness, he said. And as Sunday is out there, you do it, but when you leave church, you take your coat of righteousness and hang it up on the hook and don't wear it again until next Sunday. Brother, if we cannot live for Christ on a daily basis, if we cannot be a doer of the word every minute, every day, we need to do something about it. We need to get involved with doing God's will. Then he goes on and gives an illustration. For he that is not a doer of the word is like a man who looks in the mirror and, uh, and looks at his image in a mirror, then he walks away and forgets what he looks like. I tell you, I would like to forget what I look like when I look at it. Uh, I, I will, but I think that is uh, something else. Going on real quick. If any man among you seems to be religious and runneth not his tongue, this is the see He deceiveth his own heart. That man's religion is vain. Tongue. What about your tongue? I think it's the most cruel thing in the world. You ought to be careful. We will be given account for every idle word that we speak according to what the Bible says. We, we need to realize that our tongue is uncontrollable. It's uncontrollable. And as a result we need to be careful with what we say unless we offend. And by the way, I, I'm, uh, some of these people say I'm offended just because we're, we need to be careful what we say that the joy of Christ might be expressed by it. And we need to keep ourselves uh, within his will. Then the last verse, the last verse, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. I had a cousin, Louise Bain. She was married to a preacher in Lawrence Bain. My first full-time ministry was in Greenford, Ohio. And then we, the Greenford, Ohio, and East Palestine, Ohio, were very close together. And we had a lot of joy and fun time with my cousin. We got very close. They had four boys all by the name of, uh, began, the name began with an L. And Louise told me one time, she said, I have a problem, and I don't know how to answer it. And she was talking about her woman's group. 
And in there, she made a comment. She said, I have an old maid, never married, no children. And so she's in her late 70s. And she's not a widow. And as a result, uh, when I believe we talked about this verse, she asked the question, what about me? If I, I, I have a need, who's going to take care of me? And I said something to my cousin, I said, well, she's fatherless, since she's the only one of her family left. She's fatherless. Therefore, she falls within this category. Louise went back, and the next time the, the woman's group met, she told her what I had said. And the woman was pleased and became a very strong worker in the church as a result. And praise God for that. But notice that last statement. To keep yourself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. What's in the world? John, in 1 John, the second chapter, 14th and 15th verses. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if any man love the Father, the, uh, love, uh, love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, it is of the world. We need to keep ourselves unspotted in what's going on. Notice the last the, 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 the thing I have for my this, which I think is the key to all this chapter. Wherefore lay us apart all filthiness, the superfluity of nothingness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. We're going to be singing. One verse is softly and tenderly, saying here that needs to make a decision. Much to come as we stand, as we sing.